Come on, stand to your feet, won't you? I want you to put your I have known this, <clears throat> known this young man since he was a teenager, which is amazing. Do me a favor, no life. Can you celebrate Pastor Sean Marshall as he ministers the word? If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. I'm going to be reading from the NIV. <clears throat> if you don't have your Bible, the word should be on the screen. Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. You have it, say amen. And Saul approved of their killing him. I'm going to explain that in a minute. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip, somebody say Philip. The crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed. They all play, paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Do me a favor, just look at your neighbor and, and help me to announce the topic. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, it's time. It's time. Look at somebody else and tell them it's time. It's time. I, um, I got called to pastor a church back in 2014. I became the senior pastor of that church. Um, and when God called me to pastor that church, uh, my wife, who is a nurse, uh, my wife said, we need to update our insurance benefits because I've seen what churches do to pastors. And so my wife said wisely that we need to make sure that all of our insurance policies are current. So she scheduled an appointment, and I remember um, at this time my wife was working nights. So I remember my wife saying some things to me. How many married men are in the house today? You know how you hear most of what your wife says? But you don't always hear everything she says. So I'm sitting there, and she's telling me about this appointment that's going to come. And I'm listening to her, and I'm like, yeah, baby, yeah, baby, yeah, baby. Okay, yeah, 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 I got it. And so um, the night before the appointment, I was leaving the church. And when I was leaving the church something leaped into my spirit. It was a hunger, but it wasn't a hunger for God. It was a hunger for Popeye's chicken. And I went through a spirit, not the spirit. A spirit led me through the drive-thru. I went through the drive-thru and I got an eight-piece uh, mixed with extra hot sauce and extra honey and biscuits. Talk back to me, somebody, if you know how God can move. And, and I got this Popeye's chicken and I went home and my wife was at work and I ate myself into a good Baptist fit. I went to sleep and by the time uh, while I was sleeping, my wife had gotten home and any of you know about what it means to work nights, you sleep longer during the day. So I got up before my wife and there was some leftover chicken and I said, well, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to surprise my wife by making breakfast. I got up and I made some waffles and I reheated the chicken from last night. And I set it out on the table and I said, when my wife gets up, there will be breakfast waiting for her. And I was sitting at the counter eating when my wife came out of the bedroom and I said, honey, look, I made you some chicken and some waffles. And my wife looked at me and she said, fool! And I said, what's wrong, babe? And she said, I told you that they were going to come and take your blood 
and we needed to be fasting overnight for this appointment. And I said, yes, honey, you probably did tell me that. Watch this. Because I did not carefully listen to my wife's instructions, I was not prepared for the moment. And because I was not prepared for the moment, I could not receive the benefits. About two years ago, the Lord began to speak to me about this topic of change. And he started helping me to see that his people want change and they want the benefits of following him. But because they have not listened carefully to his instructions, they are not prepared for the moment. And because they are not as prepared as they need to be for the moment, they will miss out on the benefits that they want. And he said, my people help my people because my people are asking me to do things that they are not ready to receive. They're asking for promises for which they have not prepared. They're asking for a future that they're not ready to receive. My people want me to do things, and then they complain when I delay in blessing them. But what they fail to realize is that my delay has been a work of grace for them because had I blessed them with what they wanted when they wanted it, their lack of preparation would have caused them to default on the thing that they had been praying for. Single people praying for spouses, but they have not yet fixed their attitude. Unemployed people praying for a paycheck, but they're not ready yet to embrace their purpose, let alone show up for work on time. Want financial blessing, but won't resolve outstanding debts. You all, I pastored that church for almost four years, and when I got there, they said to me, they said, Pastor, we know we need to change. Some of my members had uh, children that were older than me. And they said, Pastor, we know we need to change. We know we need to be different in order to have a future. But what they failed to realize as a church and what I failed to realize as their leader was that they had not been equipped to embrace the changes that they had been praying for. Because change brings loss. And loss brings pain. And loss requires our surrender. And they wanted the promise, but they were not ready to embrace the process. In my current role, I serve a denomination of more than 800 churches, and my responsibility is to help strengthen those churches to be and do what God has called and created them to be and to do. And many of those churches are hungry to grow, hungry to reach souls and make disciples and do justice in the world, but they have not equipped themselves to be prepared for what the change requires. A few months ago, I talked about Popeyes. A few months ago, Popeyes came up with a chicken sandwich because they wanted to compete in the chicken sandwich department. And they came up with a sandwich. It was good, I confess. I had it a couple of times. I had it and it was good. But watch this. They ran out and frustrated a consumer base. Watch this. Because the demand grew faster than their capacity to develop their supply. What a terrible situation to be in when your blessing is ready for you, but you aren't ready for it. In the midst of this, God has given me a mandate. Help my people know how to prepare for and respond to change. Help them recognize when I'm moving and help them know how to respond. And if you don't recognize that change is happening and understand how to respond, you can get stuck. But new life, God refuses to leave you ignorant. For my assignment today is to help you recognize that change is coming and the time is now. Look at somebody and tell them now. This church is not just about to walk into a new building. New life is about to enter into a new dimension. New life is not just about to possess new property. New life is about to possess new promises. You are not just about to get a new job. You are about to receive an elevation. There is a promotion that has been prepared for you. There are situations that you've been waiting on that have already been prepared for you. There is a place in the spirit realm that has been waiting for you to recognize it. And God says, that the time for you to get ready to receive what he has been ready to do is right. Now. 
It's time to get it together or get left behind. It's time to fix what needs to be fixed. It's time to get over yourself. It's time to get over your pride. It's time for you to stop pretending like you don't need help when you need help. It's time for you to stop pretending like you got it all together. It's time for you to stop coming to church trying to say hallelujah and fixing your face and pretending like you don't need somebody to pray for you. It's time for you to stop trying to impress your friends and paying for everybody's dinner when you can hardly pay your rent. It's time for you to stop being generous. You ain't being generous. You're being needy because you want other people to like you when you pay for their meals and pay for their bills and pay for their stuff but God said it's time for you to be a little bit selfish take care of yourself pay your own bills pay your own debt take yourself out to the movie pay for your own chicken set do something for you because it's time God is ready to bless he's ready to deliver he's ready to elevate he's ready to promote you not waiting on God he's waiting on you In our text, we see the church in a pivotal moment of change. We know that before this, Jesus died and he rose. I grew up Baptist, so I'm not used to people not shouting when you say Jesus died, but he got up. I said Jesus died, but he rose. Amen. He got up, but before he left, he gave the church the Holy Spirit because he told them to wait in Jerusalem to receive the power of God. My daughter's two years old, going on 22. You heard me talk about my daughter before. And yesterday, my daughter was playing with her iPad. And she was playing learning games on her iPad. And the, the power started getting low. My wife noticed it. And so my wife sat my daughter down and took the iPad and plugged it into the wall. As soon as my wife turned her back, my daughter had ran, snatched the iPad, was playing it with it again. My wife takes it from her again, plugs it back into electricity. My wife turns around. After a few minutes, she sees my daughter grabbing the iPad. Lord says, watch this. I watch it. My wife finally says, you know, whatever, fine, because, you know, be getting old and you know, I'll be fighting with no toddler. So a few minutes later, the iPad battery runs out. Now my daughter is crying. Now Sage is crying and she's upset because she was ready to play, but she was unwilling to wait for the power. The things that you are believing God for in your next season requires a power that you have not operated in yet. It requires a discipline that you have not demonstrated yet. It requires a level of holiness that we have not walked in yet. It requires a level of growth and maturity that we have to arrive at before we can operate in the thing that God wants to do. It requires a level of understanding and awareness that we have to get to before we can get there. Watch this, please hear me, because what got you here will not get you there. Who's ready to go? Number one, it's time to transition. It's time to transition. What do I mean? We tend to use the words change and transition interchangeably, but it's different. There's a difference. Change is what happens to you, but transition is how you respond. You don't have any control over change happening. You don't have any control. Death doesn't call you and say, hey, listen, I'm thinking about taking your grandmama Tuesday at about 1.34. Does that work for you or should I reschedule? You don't have any say in that. So change happens. But transition is how we respond. Change can be an accident, transition is a decision. Change can be an event, but transition is a process. The church was experiencing you all a moment of change and everything was fine until Stephen got killed. Now, the Bible says that Stephen was one of the deacons who had been ordained. 
one of the leaders who had been elevated to help the apostles to do the work of the ministry. And Stephen was preaching the gospel, doing what was right. And the Bible says that Saul was one of the people who led the charge to persecute the Christians and ended up killing Stephen. So now things get difficult and the church can no longer stay where they are. Can I talk to y'all for real? We like to get excited about our future without being intentional with our decisions in the present. And this is what I appreciate about Pastor Hannah because Pastor Hannah walks in both spirit and in truth. You do know that everything that happens at New Life, everything that you experience, everything is prayed for and planned out. Everything is prayed for and planned out. Out. However, modern day preaching has accidentally programmed Christians to think that if you confess it and name it and claim it and blab it and grab it, that you'll just wake up one day and your future will be sitting in front of you. How many of y'all know that's a lie? No, it's going to require you some responsibility for making decisions. God is going to do it, but there are some decisions that you have to make in order to receive what God is ready to do. And the only thing, listen, the only thing that will keep you from your destiny will be your decisions. They had to decide to let Stephen go. They had to let go of a familiar thing. Stephen was a good man, wasn't a bad guy. The Bible says a man filled with faith, filled with the Holy Ghost, and he died doing exactly what was pleasing for the Lord to do. And sometimes in life we have to grieve good things that God did because even though it was a good thing, he's not doing it that way anymore. And it's hard for our minds to conceive. It's hard for us to let some things go, letting go of the familiar, letting go of the way you used to pray because now you need to transition because your prayer life needs an upgrade. You can't lay down and go to sleep anymore and say, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I step before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. God bless me and my whole family and my friends. Amen. You got to labor in some prayer to get where God is calling you to go. You got to lay out on your face, lay prostrate, crying tears, drinking tears for water, coloring out, yes, Lord, running out of words, saying, yeah, Yes, God, yes, God, yes. Help, God, help, God, help. I don't know what you're doing, but help, 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 help. Your prayer life needs an upgrade. So you got to let go of the way you used to pray. You got to let go of the way you used to worship. The deacons ain't marching in singing, shine on me anymore. You got to lift your hands in the presence of the Lord. You got to cry out to the Lord until you feel the presence of the Lord. You got to press in until the presence of the Lord breaks through in your life. You can't do it the way you used to do it anymore. You got to let go of the way you used to have church. You got to let go of your comfort. You got to let go of people that you call your friends but ain't really your friends. Them ain't your friends. They are only people with whom you have had familiar experiences with. Listen to me. Your friends are not connected to your history. Your friends are connected to your destiny. And you got to let some people go that you become comfortable with, that you become familiar with because there's some people that God want to bring in your life in this next season that's going to upgrade the the way you think, that's going to upgrade the way you feel, that's going to help you, give you the ideas that you need, give you the strategies that you need, give you the help that you need. Your old friends still talking about what was and what was and who doing what and who doing why and why didn't you do that? But there's some people that God want to bring into your life that's going to take you higher and the only thing holding you back from them people is you being willing to transition and let the old folks go. Gotta let go. It's time to let go of waiting on him to divorce his wife so he can finally marry you. It's time for you to stop being a side piece because God is ready to make you a main dish. You happy being a side chick, but God is ready to make you a wife. So it's time to call him and say, I got to let you go because God is ready to shift me because it's time. Please, somebody tell him it's time. It's time to transition. It's time to move forward. It's time for you to let go of what was and believe God that something greater can be. It's time for you to say bye-bye to some people, bye-bye to some things, bye-bye to some situations. It's time for you to let go of old thinking. It's time for you to let go of old strategies. It's time for you to let go of the way you learned because the way you learned it was relevant to the situation that you were in. But you're not in that situation anymore. That's not even the situation that you're going to. So it's time for you to learn new things so you can transition. Number two. It's time for transformation. Jesus told the disciples in Acts 1 that they would be witnesses 
for him not just in Jerusalem, but in Judea and in Samaria, in the uttermost parts of the earth. Here's the problem. Everybody was happy in Acts 2. The Bible says in Acts 2 that they were breaking bread. Miracles were happening. Peter was preaching. And everybody was excited to hear Peter preaching. Right? And thousands of people came to the Lord. And the Lord added daily such as should be added. Come on, Jesus, why do we have to go to Judea? We're having good church in Jerusalem. Why do I have to move on? I'm happy with the job I have. Why do I have to let go? I'm good where I am. Because God wants to transform you into something new, and you will never transform into a new thing in an old place. Listen to me. I was happy at my church. I never forget the day it was a week after my daughter was born. That's what my wife said. Look at me. I see. It's a week after my daughter was born. And um, I was sitting in the church office, and this denomination had offered me a job. And I did not want the job because I was happy with who I was and I was happy with where I was and I'm sitting in my office and I began to pray because the calling began to intensify in this different direction and I was sitting in my office and I said Lord it does not make sense to me that you would call me from this church I just got here doesn't make sense to me that you would call me from this church and shift me in a different direction. I said, but Lord, if this is what you want me to do, speak very clearly to me. And listen to what I said. I said, I will obey you. I said, I will obey you. <clears throat> About 10 minutes later, seven-year-old girl came into my office. Every now and then she would bring me drawings on a piece of paper. She came into my office and she drew something on a piece of paper. She put it on my desk and she said, Pastor, this is for you. I picked it up. <clears throat> At the top of the paper, she wrote, God wants you to obey him. I said, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. See, I should have prayed in tongues. I prayed in English. And because you heard my prayer in English, now you're trying to trick me. Now, I didn't get the message right away. So the other thing that she wrote on the paper was a whale. And she wrote Jonah chapter 3. This is a seven-year-old. And from that moment on, God began to rock my boat. Until I said yes. I said yes. I left the church that I loved came back here. But little did I know that in saying yes to what I could not understand, that God was transforming me and preparing me and equipping me for a future that I have been praying for. Listen to me. Change disrupts your comfort in order to transform you for your calling. Sometimes God will allow pain to come because pain reveals your purpose. Pain helps you to realize that you cannot be who you've been. You've got to transform. Look at somebody and say transform. The greatest challenge to your transformation is your comfort. The greatest challenge to your transformation is that sometimes things don't always make sense to you. Saul, who later becomes the Apostle Paul, is persecuting the Christians. Now Saul is persecuting the Christians because Saul doesn't understand this Jesus that they're talking about yet. Because Saul has not given himself an opportunity to engage with Jesus. And Saul has not developed into who God has called him to be. So Saul is destroying the church. Because when you lack intention in your development, you become destructive. 
When you refuse to develop, you become destructive to your home. When you refuse to develop, you become destructive to your marriage. When you refuse to develop, you become destructive, destructive to your job. When you refuse to develop, you become destructive to your church. Do you know what ends most marriages? It ain't money. It ain't adultery. It's two people or at least one person who refuses to grow, who refuses to transform into the husband, into the wife that God has actually called them to be. But I want you to know today that God loves you too much to let you stay who you were because you cannot be who you've been and receive what you want. So God will let pain come into your life so that the pain can disrupt you and shock your system and force you to pray and receive the person that God has called you to be because God says I've called you to be more than who you know yourself to be. You were not created to live paycheck to paycheck. You were not created to live for the weekends only. You were created to possess some land. You were created because your father owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Your father is rich in houses and land and you're supposed to transform into somebody who has the capacity to manage the inheritance that your father is ready to bring to you. You were not created to go through the motions of life. Get a job, make some money, have some fun in that. But there's a purpose on your life and that purpose Purpose requires you to be a witness for God and being a witness means that you've seen some stuff and you can testify about some stuff. I don't want to hear no witness testimony from somebody who heard something. I want to hear from somebody who was there when it happened. I want to hear from somebody who was there who went through the divorce but God delivered them. I want to hear a testimony from somebody who went through foreclosure but God delivered them. I want to hear from somebody who filed back bankruptcy, but now they own some houses and they own some cars and they got some investments and they got some IRAs and some CDs because that's a witness. Look at somebody and tell them be a witness. It's time for you to be who God created you to be so you can do what God created you to do. It's time for you to move forward in your ministry. It's time for you to stop waiting on somebody to celebrate your gift. It's time for you to stop waiting on somebody. Listen, it's time for you to stop clapping and celebrating somebody else's gift. And it's time for you to surrender your own gift to the Lord. It's time for you to stop celebrating somebody else's service and celebrate the fact that you are committed to being a servant in the house of the Lord. It's time for you to write that book. It's time for you to teach that class. It's time for you to change the government. It's time for you to get involved in prison ministry. It's time for you to speak truth into power. It's time for you to develop some kids into the man and woman of God God has ordained for them to be because I would not be standing here preaching to you had he not answered his call to me as a teenager to preach to me. And so it's time for you to recognize Recognize that the next pastor Hannah is waiting on you to answer your call and be who he created you to be so that you can shift some things. Tell somebody it's time. <laughs> waiting on your credit to get together. God can do more with your obedience than he can do with your credit score. God can do more with your yes than he can do with your bank account. God can do more with your obedience than he can do with your resume. It don't matter that you don't have no experience. The Holy Ghost got all the experience that you need. All he needs you to do is be willing to say yes. Don't need anybody to validate me. Don't need anybody to affirm me. I just need to know what is the Lord saying to me. Now, Philip, somebody say Philip. Philip gets up, and he says, look, I'm not about to stay here and get killed by no Paul, no Saul. Who don't know he Paul yet? He don't know that his purpose is to help me, so he's hurting me, but I'm not going to stay here and be stuck trying to help him. Jesus got to knock him off his own horse. I got to get up and go do what God created me to do. So Philip gets up and he goes down to another city in Samaria. Somebody say Philip. Somebody say Philip. Now, Philip was one of the other deacons that was ordained when Stephen was ordained. Philip does what God ordained for him to do. And when it's time to transform, you will have the opportunity to be and do the things God created you to be and do, and you will receive change when change happens because you realize that change comes to change you, not hurt you. It comes to change you. 
So Philip goes. Now watch this, because Jesus said, greater works than these shall you do. It went from the disciples hearing Jesus preach. When Jesus goes up, the disciples hear Peter preach. When Peter goes up, the disciples hear Stephen preach. Philip has been watching this whole time. So now, Philip, it's time for you to give out of you what Jesus, Peter, and Stephen have been putting in you. When you realize it's time to transform, you no longer are concerned with who's showing up to preach on a Sunday morning. You're no longer concerned with who's showing up to preach on a Thursday night. What you're praying about is, God, what do you have for me to do? Who do you have for me to pray for? It don't matter to me who's there going to be praying for me. I got a song that I got to sing to somebody. I have a word that I got to minister to somebody. And let me fall in line with the house because I see the pattern now. The pattern is that when my leader goes up, I go up. When he goes up, I go up. When he elevates, I elevate. When he gets promoted, so I'm not going to be complaining because things are changing. I'm just wondering around walking around looking for my promotion. Where's my promotion at? Where's my elevation at? Where's my anointing? Where does God need me? Because there's a call on my life too. It's time to transform. And finally, it's time to trust. It's time to trust. It's time to transition. It's time to transform. It's time to trust. I'm almost done. Don't nobody say take your time. Don't nobody say that. I ain't got no time to take. Y'all don't see this big red clock right here. I do. Watch this. It's time to trust. The Bible says in verse 8, Philip goes down. Philip preaches. And unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out. Paralyzed were healed. The lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. That city was a city in Samaria. The joy that they were familiar with was a city in Jerusalem. Sometimes we struggle to receive what God wants to do because we have a hard time letting go of what God did. God did great things in Jerusalem, but this is a new situation now. And if we could learn to trust God, listen to me, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered into your heart. Can you trust God to believe that the next place in your life is going to be greater than the last place in your life? Can you let go of the last thing God blessed you with in order to receive? Can you trust God enough that you can walk in here and say, God, I grieve what I've lost, but I'm ready to receive what you have next for me. Because if you can do that, watch this. If you can trust God to get you on the other side of this thing, on the other side of your divorce, on the other side of the diagnosis, on the other side of being fired, there's greater joy in the next place that God wants to take you to. You will have joy, watch this, and you will bring joy. I'm done for real. I know that one of the things we struggle to trust God with the most is time. God, when are you going to do it? I've been waiting a long time. When are you going to do it, God? Lord, I want to remember what to do with a husband when I get him. <laughs> what we fail to understand is that God is not limited by time. The anxieties that we have about time don't apply to God. You all, I own a consulting company. And I had a contract last year. It was a big contract. So I hired some subcontractors. And one of the subcontractors I hired was a graphic designer in Bangladesh. And so we were moving forward. We were hitting all of our deadlines. And I realized that I had forgotten to take care of something. And so I reached out. This was a Friday. I'll never forget this. This was a Friday. Now, my, 
designer worked fast, but what I needed, I needed by Monday morning at 9 a.m. And so I sent him a message, and I said, can you get this to me by Monday at 9 a.m.? He said, that's kind of tight. He said, I can get it to you by Monday around 7 or 8. Now that made me anxious because I needed him to do a design that I needed to drop into a document. And so I said, okay, well, let me just wait and see. I sent him a message Friday night. Are you doing it? He said, I'm working on it. I got you. I sent him a message Saturday morning. He said, I said, any chance you can get it done now? He said, no, I can't get it done. Really, I'm looking at all my projects. I can only finish this by Monday. As soon as I get it to you, it's Monday around 6. I can get it to you by Monday around 6. So Sunday night comes, and I'm anxious because these people have paid me a lot of money, and I have to deliver something to them by Monday at 9 a.m. My wife's getting my daughter ready for bed. She's taking her bath, and I turn on my phone, 7 o'clock Sunday night. I turn on my phone, and he sent me the thing. I'm like, well, first of all, hallelujah. <laughs> so I sent him a message saying, thank you for finishing this on time, and I sent him a bonus. He sent me back a message, and he said, thanks for the bonus, but I did not finish it early. He said, do you remember that I'm ahead of you? <laughs> Sunday night, 7 o'clock in Chicago, is 6 o'clock Monday morning in Bangladesh. Watch this. I was worried. I was stressing out. I was wondering whether or not he was going to get it done. And while I was worried about whether or not he was going to do it, he had already done. 